you Gentile out there who is not descended from Israel uh, physically, um, you are the true Jew. You are the descendant of Abraham. You are, Mm -hmm. like for real, fully, completely, totally, truly Israel. This is the Bible Sojourner, where we discuss issues related to the Bible, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, professor of Old Testament and biblical languages at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Shalom and welcome. Thanks for joining. Welcome back to the Bible Sojourner. Today, we're going to be talking about the people of Israel, and they are definitely in the news nowadays. They're in the news most days, I suppose, given their violent area of the Middle East where they're present. But what we're going to talk about specifically is whether or not they are the true Israel, whether or not they are the chosen people of God, or whether the church should be identified as the true Israel. According to Jeff Durbin, the true Israel would be Gentile and Jew who are incorporated into the body of Christ, the church. And so we want to look at that today. And this basically comes from a video that Durbin and Apologia Studios put out. The video is entitled Hamas, Israel, and the Great Tribulation. Are they connected? And they they did this a few weeks ago, but I'm just getting around to it now. I've been super busy, but it's been it's been good to watch it, to listen to it. Uh, I've had a lot of people reach out asking if I would make some comments on it. In fact, uh, this may or may not surprise people, but some of the most of the comments I, I get are requests to review certain things. And Jeff Durbin and a lot of his comments are at the head of the list, if you will. And part of that is because he's pretty outspoken about his post-millennial convictions, his theonomy viewpoints, and we're going to make some comments about that as we go. But primarily today in this episode, he's making some comments about who the true Israel actually is. And I want to use this as an example. Now, I've said this before. I've reviewed some of Durbin's stuff before. I really appreciate the work that he does, and he and his team are always on the front lines working hard, and we can genuinely appreciate that. And at the same time, he's he's a very public figure, has a very thriving social media arm of Apologia Studios. And I've heard from probably a dozen different pastors that they have people who have been influenced by the YouTube videos that Apologia Studios is putting out, and Jeff Durbin in particular. And one of the things I want to do in a video like this and in other videos that I have planned in the future is showing that there is some inconsistencies in how Durbin and others like him are applying scripture. And there's not just faulty exegetical work, which becomes evident as we look through this, but there's also a lack of logical consistency. There are some emotional fallacies that are brought forward And so we're going to look at those and just try to be rational about it. Again, without making uh, a judgment on Durbin as a person, you know, he's working harder than anybody. And I can genuinely believe that, you know, he'll, he'll walk into heaven and have more heavenly reward than I am. And, but I'm going to leave that up to Jesus, right? I mean, he's, he's working super hard and I hope I'm working as hard as I can for the master. But I think what's at stake here is, is accurate treatment of God's word. That's why this is an important issue. And making emotional appeals uh, about how Gentiles are Israel and Israel doesn't have a status as a chosen people before God, we really need to call those out because we want to interpret scripture faithfully. And if you listen to the last two episodes that we did, really the most important thing you can think through is how to read your Bible and how do we interpret scripture. And so this is a crucial issue. And I want to just point out why Durbin's viewpoints have quite a few problems with them. And so when we're bringing this up, we're going to jump into this video. It's Hamas, Israel, and the Great Tribulation. Are they connected? Uh, It's been viewed thousands of times on YouTube. And then there were shorter clips that were put out there for social media. I think uh, there was a little 12-minute version about, is Israel the chosen people of God? There were some shorts that were put on YouTube. All All that's fine, but we're going to use the longer video for time clips so that when I reference a timestamp, you, you'll you know what I'm referring to. And so I want to uh, just jump into the video and start reviewing it and talk about some of the problems. I think that'll be helpful for us. 
And as by way of context, we're going to jump in at the 32 minute mark. 3204 technically. And up to this point, there was some advertisement, just introductory discussions. And the three people on the clip, if you're not watching this, if you're listening, are Jeff Durbin. He's the one who talks the most. Luke the Bear, that's his last name. No, that's just how they introduce. I can't remember his last name, but so you got Jeff Durbin, Luke, and then another guy who's named Chris, I believe. Yeah, he, uh, no, Zach. Uh, I confused him and another Zach. Uh, he's he's uh, the director of communications for End Abortion now. So it's Zach, Jeff, and then Luke are the ones who are uh, talking in, in this podcast on this video. And so we're going to be reviewing their comments. Now, what brought this up was they were talking about the Hamas-Israel conflict and, and you know, just by way of comment on that, obviously that's a tragic situation. And a lot of people have questioned whether or not that relates to end times prophecy. And from a, from a futurist perspective, I think the appropriate response would be that we don't know. We don't know, obviously in and of itself, it's not real, it's not related, but it could cause ramifications in the future, but we just don't know, you know, there, there's a lot that could happen. And so I think, you know, the scriptures talk about looking forward to an imminent return of Christ and something like this could easily start a chain reaction that could happen very quickly with a, with a world war. But at the same time, it could amount to nothing where nobody wants to stand up for Hamas and Israel deals with them and we're left with that situation. So, so I just think some people go crazy on the, on the futurist side of things and they say, Oh, this is, this is exactly what we've been waiting for. Well, we don't know. We don't know. Okay. So let's just be realistic about that. But in response Durbin and the Apologia crew here noticed that there were some pastors and, and they quote one pastor, I'm not sure who it was, but he said, you know, I stand unequivocally with Israel. And they they picked up on that word unequivocally saying, okay, well, how could you ever say unequivocally? And they go, you know, all, all about that. And I just want to say, I agree, like unequivocally, at least at its di dictionary definition now at the same time, context is king. So I don't know what context this was at, but the the idea that that we can stand unequivocally with Israel has never been true, um, whether Old Testament, New Testament, whatever. Uh, the 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 point is that they can still sin is is the issue, and so we we support Israel and we love Israel, and I would argue they are God's chosen people. We'll talk about that later, but unequivocally doesn't it means that we still would hold them responsible for sin. They are technically in rebellion against God. They are in exile. And so we can't rejoice when they sin. Now, in this situation, in fighting against Hamas, they're not sinning. That is within their right to do that. And, and Durbin and the others affirm that. So they're not saying that Israel's in the wrong here. They're just talking theoretically. The main issue that they have is somebody assuming that we need to stand with Israel because they're God's chosen people. And their big supposition, their big point is that Israel is not God's chosen people. So we're going to talk about that. And that's where the discussion gets good at 32 minutes and five seconds. But that was the context of why this clip uh, arose. So we're going to jump right in here at 3205. And we're going to try to play as, as much as we can. It's going to take us a little bit today. But as we go through this, uh, we're going to try to analyze uh, the clips effectively. Okay, so we're going to jump right in at 3205. And here we go. To ask the question, is somebody who is physically descended today from Israel by blood, physically descended from Israel, who rejects the Christian message, rejects Jesus Christ as Messiah and Savior, hates the message of Jesus, spits on Christians in the streets of Israel, is that person God's chosen people? Are they truly Jewish. And look, it's an important question to ask because I, look, I put it all on a table. You're not hearing from people who just always opposed this idea. Luke was raised in this. Zach was raised in this. My whole Christian education and Bible college education was right in line with that. Those are God's chosen people, God's chosen people, God's chosen people over there. And uh, we're sort of like the, the, the stepchildren, uh, you know, like, so that's God's chosen. And we're like, the, we're like the stepchild, like, you know, um, yeah, we get all these blessings and stuff, but they're really the apple of God's eye. Um, I say a 65 has something to say about that. It sure does. It sure does. And so let's go to the Bible itself to ask the question, does the Bible give to us 
this idea that the modern evangelical has today in the West about the state of Israel today, the people in the land of Israel today, does it give us the idea that we have been raised with in, in evangelicalism? Um, and I want to say, no. Okay, so that that's how they introduce this. I think if we if we analyze this, what we're what we're immediately thinking through it as he's introducing this is he's basically making the big point that that Israel, you know, spitting on Christians and you know just very evil in many ways, and they're going to talk about the support of the LGBT community and how Israel is is very secular and and all that, and basically they're saying because Israel is so is so sinful they can't possibly be the chosen people of god and that is that is problematic on many different levels okay we're going to get more into that as they get more into that but i would just ask a question is one's actions indicative of whether or not they are the chosen people of god okay so that that's really at the crux of the issue here is is somebody's action, just think about that from a Gentile perspective. If I am chosen of God, if I'm elect to salvation, the things that I do as a non-believer before I'm a, before I'm a Christian, does that mean that I am chosen or I'm not chosen? Of course not. There are lots of believers who have done wicked things, but they were still of the elect. They were still chosen and then God saves them. And so it's not any different here for Israel. When when somebody says Israel is God's chosen people, they're not making a qualitative statement about who they are in good deeds or righteousness. They're talking about God's decision to use somebody, in this case, a nation. And so again, one's actions have nothing to do with whether or not whether or not they are chosen of God. That's God's choice irrespective. In fact, even in Joshua 24, Joshua makes a big point about how Abram was chosen by God when he was worshiping the gods of the Chaldees. So it's not exactly, it's actions do not determine one's election. We'll say it that way. And so, you know, Durbin is a Calvinist. And so it's kind of odd that he would make this kind of argumentation. But again, this is more of an emotional appeal, right? Uh, In fact, I would even say, you look at, okay, let, let's go past Abraham because maybe he's too easy of an example. Just think of the Exodus generation. Uh, Ezekiel 20 talks about how when Israel was chosen by God, they're, they're brought out of Egypt through this marvelous redemption experience of Exodus. Did they deserve that? Had, they, had that generation been righteous in order that God would, would save them out of Egypt? No. In fact, that generation was one of the most wicked generations. Ezekiel 20 says that Israel brought out the idols of Egypt with them in that Exodus experience. God's doing all these amazing and marvelous miracles, and yet God is, and, and as God displays his power, Israel is just throwing it back in his face constantly. And so it's kind of interesting how there's this there's this real big emotional appeal here by Durbin saying, you know, you know, the this this nation, this nation that's in the land of Israel right now is rebellious against God. They're wicked. They reject God. And when I hear that, I say, yeah. And when has that never been the case? Uh, that has always been the case for Israel's existence. They've always been in rebellion against God. There's not one exception to that. You trace the history of Israel. It just really seems like a, an odd argument to me, but that's the way it works. Okay, so now we skip forward a little bit. They talk a little bit more about um, what they're going to talk about. Zach m- makes a mention about how basically it's the dispensational idea of God has two peoples and two plans. And we've talked about that before. That's kind of a uh, faulty argument. But now we jump in at 3357. And so here's here's uh, another comment of summarizing what they're trying to argue here. Uh, that there is an Israel of God, and everybody who trusts in Jesus is a part of the true Israel of God, and that everyone who trusts in Jesus is truly a Jew. So I'm Jewish. Shalom. Um, he's Jewish. <laughs> he's Crime. Jewish. True Jews, inwardly Jews, we've been grafted into the Israel of God. And so we don't believe in replacement theology of like the church replaced Israel. We believe there is a true Israel and anybody who's in Christ is in it. I believe that when God promised Abraham descendants as numerous as the stars, that I'm the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. 
That's I believe that I'm one of his descendants. That's right. Because of the Messiah. Yeah. It's a- okay, so I think about what Zach just said there, and it was affirmed by Durbin saying, yeah, that's right, and everything. And so he's referring to the promise to Abraham in Genesis 15 as part of the Abrahamic covenant as you will have descendants as numerous as the stars and as the sand on the seashore. And you think about that and you'd be like, okay, is that true that Christians are fulfillment of that? Well, there may be, now I'll say it this way, there may be, and I give a big maybe there, some sort of typological fulfillment there. Okay, that's possible. But scripture actually doesn't leave it up to our imagination about what that is actually talking about. And you can easily just search scripture for language about this multiplication. And I have a few verses that I just wrote down. Uh, Deuteronomy is very clear about this. And so Deuteronomy is a very near context to Genesis. Moses writes both Genesis and Deuteronomy. So if anyone understands what Genesis 15 is about, it's going to be Moses. Good old Moshe. And so in Deuteronomy 1.10, he says, The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. Now, is he talking about the church? Is he talking about believers? No. He's making a reference back to God's covenant with Abraham, saying he's going to multiply his physical descendants. And so, yes, that is what was talking about. See, there is a physicality to this. Now, I'm, I'm not saying... Now, I leave it open saying, okay, we can assume that perhaps perhaps there's there's a spiritual dimension to that, but you really have to have blinders on to say that there's that there can't be a physical dimension to that. Now, I'm not sure if he would say there can't be a physical dimension. I think it's obvious he would have to say there's physical, but it's weird how he's framing the argument if, if that's true, because he seems to be saying, listen, it's all about the church, all about the church, but scripture doesn't paint that picture at all. Okay, so uh, Deuteronomy 1 talks about that. Deuteronomy 10 also talks about that. Deuteronomy 10, 22 says, Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. So talking about the fulfillment of God's promise, how God has been faithful, he's taking care of the people of Israel. And so, yeah, I think the the this is a helpful summary of what they're trying to say. They're trying to say, hey, Gentiles, anyone who believes in Jesus is the fulfillment of this promise chosen people of, of Israel idea. Now, it's interesting because he says, no, we, we don't believe that the church is the replacement of Israel, but then, you know, and and I'm fine. Let's use whatever language you guys want to, right? Because uh, we don't need to call it replacement theology. But if you look at the Old Testament and you look at the New Testament, there is a replacement there because the Old Testament was concerned with ethnic Jews. That What did we just read in Deuteronomy, right? It's talking about those who are a part of a specific nation, and then there's some sort of change. So according to them, where now true Israel is Jew and Gentile, which is a significant departure. So sure, let's, we don't have to call it replacement. Um, you know, sometimes people call it fulfillment, uh, expansion, completion, theology, whatever, whatever term you're using, the point is that scripture has changed somehow, that there is, that there's a, there's a difference between New Testament and Old Testament, uh, in their viewpoint. Now I would say there is no difference. Um, I think that, that the differences that we do see are attributed to other things, not a change in the covenant. I think the covenant remains the same, but Notice this is a good summary of, of how this is how this is working. Okay, so now we pick up again, and now comes in to play the discussion of Romans two. So I give you an example from from an inspired you know, an inspired apostle teaching exactly this, and we could do this over and over and over again. Uh, verse twenty seven of Romans chapter two. Paul's having a discussion about the uncircumcised and circumcised, who keeps the law, who doesn't keep the law. He says, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. Can you get more explicit than that? Than the Apostle Paul, a Jew himself, saying, this isn't the real thing. This isn't where it's at outwardly. It's inwardly. And so the Apostle Paul makes it explicit there. 
is that you're not even truly Jewish because you are outwardly or physically Jewish. You have to be inwardly Jewish. It's a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. And you could be Gentile, physical, physical Gentile, and you could have the Spirit of God indwelling you and circumcision to the heart, and that's Paul saying, that's a true Jew. Wait, but he's not actually physically Jewish. No, but he's truly a child of Abraham. He's a descendant. That's true Israel right there. That's a true Jew. And so... Okay, so now when he's making this... Now when he's making this comment, I, I think it's it's helpful to understand what he's claiming here and then just dissect it because this is the exegesis idea, right? Is he exegeting Romans 2 correctly? Now, if you look at Romans 2 and really the whole section, the, the section actually starts in verse 17 where he's specifically targeting Jews, okay? So he's specifically saying, okay, I'm talking to everyone who claims to be a Jew. And then he, he goes down the list. And this is well established. Almost every commentator, you know, I, I'm, I actually can't even think of an exception. Every commentator understands that the breakup of Romans 1 through 3 is targeting Gentiles in the beginning and then switching and targeting Jews to give the understanding and indication that all, whether Gentile or Jew, you are sinners, right? And in need of Christ as Savior. And so this is a very important concept, and he's talking to Jews specifically. And yes, he's he's trying to undermine their their reliance on the law. He's trying to rely their reliance on the the premier expression of that in their identity as being circumcised. And so one of the things that he says is that, listen, you're circumcised, but that in and of itself doesn't mean what you think it does. And so I think that that's, that's totally fine. But notice what is not said in those verses is that he does not say that those who are not circumcised are real Jews, right? So if you look at the actual text itself, um, you know, and he read over this, but he says, no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. In other words, he's he's saying that to claim Jewish identity is not sufficient or it's not enough. Uh, rather, there's something else that that matters, right? But notice what Durbin and others say is that he's actually going a step further saying that Anybody who is, you know, obeying God's law is Jewish. Now, I don't see that here. The, the text doesn't say that here. It's one of those things where, where it seems like what, what Paul is talking about here, and we'll talk about this more when Durbin brings up Romans 9, because I think there it's helpful to compare both passages as Durbin does. And I think when we compare both, we see, yeah, Paul's not saying that anybody can be Jew. He's saying those who claim to be Jew, not all of those who claim to be Jewish are actually Jewish. So notice the circle is actually made smaller, not bigger, if that makes sense. See, what a lot of people want to do is take these passages and they want to restrict them saying, okay, or, or they want to expand them saying, okay, the Jewish nation is expanded, is completed, is fulfilled to include everybody. But that's not really what's being said here. What's being said is that of that circle that claims to be Jewish, that, that has a Jewish identity, that circle actually should be smaller because not everybody who's a part of that circle is actually what it means to be a part of that identity. So it's actually a more uh, constricted circle than an expanded circle, at least on its face value. Uh, that Romans 9 and Romans 2 both do that, and we'll, we'll make more mention of that in just a moment. But I will say, the, the one thing about Romans 2 that makes it interesting, and I'm going to throw this out there because I want to be, be fair, is that Paul uses the example of Gentile Christians in the immediate context. To, to kind of undermine this Jewish reliance upon their identity of law keeping. And so he says in verse 26, if a man who is uncircumcised, in my mind, that would have to be a Gentile, I think. If a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So in other words, what Paul seems to be arguing is that even a Gentile, if he keeps the law, he's doing what the law intended. He, he's going to be regarded as being circumcised. Now, that's with regard to law keeping. Now, let's take, let's take 
the conclusion that Durbin and others may want to draw from this passage, okay? Let's let's assume for for sake of argument that you have here Paul broadening the circle saying everybody who is right with God is a part of a Jew. Okay, that's not what the text says, but let's just assume that for sake of argument just because I really want to make a point here. Even if that's true, which again, I don't think that that's the natural reading of this. I I lean far more to the other side, but let's say that that's true. Um, I I have friends who think that that's true here and that's totally fine. Uh, Let's assume that argument is true. Does that mean that what Paul is doing here in defining Jew as anybody who's obeying God, does that mean that in every other context of the word Jew or Israel in the New Testament, then we should take this meaning and apply it there? Uh, the answer is no. The answer is very much no. And you you know that that wouldn't work. Everybody knows that that wouldn't work. Everybody would have to say, okay, yeah, we could never do that. Think about Paul's earlier words when he says, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So what, what would he be saying there? He, he would be saying um, to those who are really obeying God's law, to the real Jews, the Gentiles and Jew, the gospel is to them first and then also Gen- No, obviously not. The point is that you can't take one passage meaning and just apply it on all others. That's called proof texting um, or really source texting because you're looking for something to support your idea and then you're ignoring the context of all these other passages. And so the point is, even if Romans two, and this is a big even if, because I don't think it's I don't think it's right, but but let's say even even if it does, even if Romans two is expanding, so that in some sense we could call Christians a true Jew. You are a true Jew because you stand for what it really means to be a Jew. Let's say we use that title. Does that then mean? that Israel is not chosen of God? Does that mean that there is no future for Israel? I think any honest interpreter would have to say that would be ridiculous. And so when we think of that, it's it's one of those concepts where we need to understand that hermeneutically, the hermeneutical practice would mandate, even if there's this you know new Jewish identity being brought upon Christians, which again, I don't, I don't accept, but we still have plenty of other passages like Romans 9 to 11 talks about a difference between Gentiles and Jews. And in that context, it's obvious that there is a future for Israel. Uh, You go back in the Old Testament and there, there's very clear passages which talk to the nation of Israel about a future for them and and they being God's chosen people in the midst of disobedience or whatever. The point is, you can't just take Romans 2 and say, and this erases everything else in the Bible. Obviously, you can't do that. But for some reason, you know, People quote it like this and say, okay, well, this means everybody's a Jew. And no, there, as we'll talk about a little later, uh, there are, uh, there is actually language that is used of Israel that is used of the church, but that doesn't mean that Israel and the church are the same. Uh, And that's actually a huge, huge logical fallacy to assume that. And so we need to be thinking clearly about these issues. Okay. So we want to move on to. Uh, now, what they do to kind of show their their point at this at this juncture is they show some videos of Israelites of modern Jews spitting on Christians and whatever. And and again, I just want to say I think that that's more of a that's more of an emotional argument. Uh, you know, Israel has always done that. Israel, are, are, can you really say that? Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel did not suffer beatings and and were they spit upon and all. Of course they were. Uh, Israel has always rejected the true prophets and the Messiah himself. So we can't say that that is indicative of not being chosen. That's just par for the course. That's Israel's lot until they repent, which the prophets say will happen. Uh, and so that's what we are looking at here. So after the video is showing Jews disrespecting Christians, Now we jump in at about uh, 429-ish. If I can find it here, here we go, okay. This is to suggest that actually we should see those who are physically Israel today as not true Jews and needing to be true Jews, Hmm. needing to come to the Jewish Messiah. 
Uh, what I'm saying is that we should see the state of Israel today as a mission field. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be saying to you, you're the chosen people of God, you're good to go. We should be saying, no, nobody is the chosen person of God who rejects Jesus Christ as Savior. Cause that's okay, I just want to stop right there and notice, notice the either or fallacy here that he's committing is he's saying we shouldn't be saying Israel is God's chosen people. We should be viewing them as a mission field. Hello? Like who? Like, I okay, just show me one person. I'm sure they're out there. Okay. There are a bunch of crazy people that view things, but most people, everybody I know understands that those two are not a part of the either or conjunction is they are God's chosen people and they need to be evangelized. They need to be witnessed to. They need to repent from their sins. And so, yeah, I'm not sure. You know, they say that they all grew up in dispensational churches and whatever. But yeah, this is pretty typical is a lot of times <clears throat> there's just misrepresentations. And this is, again, an another one of those. Um, and, you know, I, it happens. I'm sure I've misrepresented people. And, you know, I hope people, you know, let me know that so I can try to make corrections. But this is just another, another um, you know, logical fallacy of saying we shouldn't be saying Israel is ch God's chosen people. We should be evangelizing them. Well, it's not either or, it's both and. So we just need to, you know, mention that, call it out, um, and continue. That's what they were relying on in the passage that you quoted. Yeah. Right? We have Abraham as our father. We have Abraham as our father. It's God can raise lineage. up from these stones heirs of Abraham. Oh, so rocks can be Jews. Rocks can be Jews. You see the point? Okay, so that's kind of funny because my the point I see is a little different than what I think he's trying to see. He's he's trying to say, see, it doesn't matter if you're ethnically Jewish. And my point is more of a hermeneutical one, is based on what you just talked about in Romans 2, should we take this text now in what you're saying and saying rocks can be Jews? So anytime the word Israel or Jew is mentioned, should we think of rocks then? Is that what we're saying? Is because rocks are Jews, now anytime Israel is mentioned, we need to think... Obviously, that's ridiculous. And I don't... They would never say that, right? But I hope that even by mentioning this, there's a little inconsistency that's shown here, is that if you're going to proof text, why would you proof text Romans 2 and try to put that on all the other passages? Uh, why not take this passage and just say, well, to mention Jews means rocks, right? Obviously, it always comes back to hermeneutics. Well, we've belabored that a lot on this podcast in, in trying to talk about this, is it, is it always comes back to how you read the Bible, and eat, the meaning of each passage is found within that passage, okay? The meaning of each passage is found within that passage. As my good friend and colleague Dr. Vlock says, he says, passage priority means not that you take another passage and and put it over as a template and interpret but that the meaning of that passage is found in that passage it's a contextual decision in other words the people who are getting the book of galatians just for a weird you know example the people who are getting the book of galatians they don't need the book of romans in order to interpret galatians or to put it in even better perspective the the israelites who are studying the book of exodus don't need the book of Ephesians in order to understand Exodus, right? This is this is just very basic hermeneutical uh, ideas. Okay, moving on, uh, right from there. I mean, how, how, how much of Scripture needs to be brought to bear on this before we're finally corrected as evangelical Christians in the West? Stop calling somebody who rejects with rabid hostility the message of Jesus. Stop calling them the chosen person of God. Stop doing it. Scripture doesn't do that. Paul explicitly says, outwardly, no. That's not what makes you a Jew. It's an inward thing. It's of the heart. And God can do that to Gentiles. God can do that to rocks. That is the message of the New Testament from Jewish people. Don't forget that. These are people who are physically Jewish who are saying, that's not what makes you Jewish. If you want to be a child of Abraham, he'll do it to rocks. Okay, he'll do it to rocks, he'll do it to Gentiles. There is a true Israel today, an Israel of God. It's right. it's comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. Okay, so now notice he was very strong and passionate about this. And you know, that's that that's his persuasive power, right? They um if you if you watch the the video that's going on YouTube, I mean that's that's where this primarily comes. They do it on the podcast, but YouTube is their primary audience. And 
they have the good camera angles. You know, he looks into the camera. He says it passionately. And everyone says, yeah. And, you know, I remember looking through the chat because this was premiered and, and you looked at how people were saying it and people are saying, amen, that's true, blah, blah. And, and I just think to myself, okay, this is so easy to disprove. I mean, realistically, he, he flat out says scripture never calls Israel God's chosen people when they are disobedient. I mean, now maybe he meant something else and maybe he just misspoke. I mean, I kind of hope he did because that is such a, such a, such a faulty statement, right? Because scripture all over calls Israel God's chosen people, even when they're disobedient, right? And now that goes back with my, the point that I gave previously. And so, you know, I'll just give you a a broad spattering of verses. Uh, You know, I just, picked out a few, but it's just really easy to find lots. I mean, Psalm 105, 43, he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. That's Psalm 105, verse 43. Well, his chosen ones, it's referring to Israel as God's chosen people. Now, again, I always tell my Old Testament students when we go through Old Testament survey one, because we go through Genesis through uh, Kings. And when we talk about the Exodus, one of the things I try to really stress is that the Exodus generation was very, very wicked. I mean, they brought idols out of Egypt. They abandoned God immediately with the sin of the golden calf. They even refused to to obey God to go into the land of Canaan when God says, I'll give you victory. But then after God says, okay, well, you, you're you going to wander in the wilderness then, then they try to go into Canaan. So it's like basically whatever God tells them to do, they just do the opposite. They are the opposite generation. And even as they're wandering in the wilderness, they refuse to circumcise their children. Okay, and that brings up in Joshua, when they cross the Jordan River, then God says the whole generation needs to be circumcised. So this is not a good generation. This is a rebellious generation, yet God has no problem calling them his chosen people. Okay, so yeah, pretty, pretty odd. Amos 3.2, very very simple, uh, similar in many ways. You only have I chosen or known, your translation might read, it is the word yada, but that is the Hebrew word for knowing. Uh, Also, it's a synonym for choosing. So that's a good, good passage there. And in the context of Israel's disobedience, he says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. So in other words, because they're God's chosen people, he holds them to a standard, even though they are rebellious, iniquitous, he judges them. Uh, Psalm 135, verse 4, the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself. Israel is his own possession. Again, this was not a righteous nation at any time. Uh, Isaiah 14, 1, for the, and this is uh, especially helpful because this is eschatological. The Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel and will set them in their own land. Right. So eschatological, you have the two parts back to back. God will again choose Israel and will again place them in their land. Okay. So again, scripture talks about this all the time in contrast to how Durbin, you know, says scripture doesn't talk this way. Scripture talks this way all the time. Uh, Deuteronomy 7, uh, 6 through 8. Uh, we won't, we won't talk too much about that. It's just the classic passage where God says, I've chosen you not because you're mightier than the other nations, not because you're more numerous, but just because I love you and I want to. That's God's. So what is the foundation? Again, Durbin is a Calvinist. He should know this. The foundation of God's election is not the righteousness of the people. It is God's choice. That is election. Okay. And so that's why it's just, you know, odd to see these kinds of arguments. And so I think we, we ought to call them out when they're, when they're not being consistent in those, in those realms. Now, those are just the old Testament, but there are new Testament passages as well, which we will make a few comments on um, later as we, as we look at more of what the video is going on here. And so we have to ask the question, should we be calling somebody who's spitting on the gospel that is physically Jewish, should we be calling them the chosen person of God because they are physically descended from David? The New Testament doesn't do that. The New Testament opposes that perspective. And so I think there needs to be a correction in terms of like, well, we need to be thinking about the state of Israel today as a mission field, and Jesus is going to win them, of course. I believe in in, in a complete conversion of the Jewish people to Christ. But All right, so now notice again what he's saying here, and same kind of argument, but now he specifically, I don't know if he intentionally 
uh, changed this way or, but he said the new Testament doesn't do that. So I don't know if in his mind he was thinking, well, the old Testament does do that. So we need to make sure we switch to the new Testament. I'm not sure what was going on in his mind. I, I'm not playing that game, but, but I will say, does the old Testament mean nothing? Uh, and the irony behind all of this is that Durbin is a professed theonomist. And I don't know if he says that he, he loves Bonson and he says that Bonson is a huge, uh, I mean, Bonson has passed away, but through his writings and lectures and everything, Bonson is a, is a big influence on his life. And if he is a theonomist, the, the classic undergirding foundation for theonomy is that the Old Testament law principles, the, the covenant found in the Old Testament is to apply in the New Testament unless specifically changed, unless there is something that is, that is just very bold highlighted saying this is different, like the ceremonial laws or the sacrificial laws. Uh, Hebrews talks about those things being done away with. So yes, we, we can make those done away with. But it's interesting that nothing in the Old Testament says that Israel is no longer God's chosen people. In fact, there's repetition of this fact. And yet there's a there's a reliance on the New Testament in, in what we refer to oftentimes in critiquing this as New Testament priority. And actually, I'm not sure what Durbin would say on this, but many people who are in the realm of covenant theology just admit and say New Testament priority is the way to go. And in in many ways... In many ways, that's not actually a critique for them. They, they actually embrace that. And that's on the Pado baptist side as well as the Reformed Baptist side. Many people will, will hold to that idea and say, yes, we, we ought to embrace New Testament priority. And the assumption is that the New Testament is going to be more clear and we're going to then be able to interpret the Old Testament in light of that. So again, taking a specific interpretation of Romans 2 and then applying that backwards through the Old Testament into how that ought to function. Now, the irony is that theonomists are not supposed to do that. Theonomists are actually supposed to, you know, treat the Old Testament with a little more flair. They're supposed to they're supposed to say, "Hey, the Old Testament is God's word too. We need to be relying on that." But this is really ironic when it's inconvenient to do so with regard to Israel's chosen status and God's promises to Israel that is ignored. So I don't know, maybe we should come up with a different title for, uh, for theonomists who do this, because I think it's, it's kind of disingenuous to say we hold to the old Testament, but not really. Right. So anyway, the point is that this also occurs in the New Testament. Uh, it's not as if in the New Testament, it's silent about Israel being God's chosen people. So again, I just think, I don't know what he's thinking when he says the New Testament doesn't do this. The New Testament doesn't call Israel God's chosen people. I just wonder if he's, yeah, I, I just don't, I just don't know what goes through his mind. So I'll just give you a few, few uh, uh, comments. So Romans 9, 3 through 5, talk about Israel being God's chosen people. We'll talk a little bit more about that later because he does. In Romans 11, 28 through 29, it says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, talking about Israel, but as regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Now, I don't know how to get around that, right? Romans 11, with regard to election, with regard to choosing, God has chosen Israel and God's gifts and calling are irrevocable. Okay, that's just very clear. Additionally, when Paul preaches to the masses in Acts 13, verse 17, he says, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. So I guess the only way to get around that is saying Paul was talking about a past event, which has no bearing anymore. But that's not what Paul's doing in his sermon He's relying on the fact that there's a continuity and thought process there that they're going to say, yes, that's true. We are God's chosen people. All right. Luke 2 is another example of that. In Luke 2, verse 32, you have Simeon's prophecy who he's he's there at the temple. Jesus comes as a baby is presented and Simeon rejoices. And Simeon prophesies and says that this Christ child, this child is a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people, Israel. Okay. Now that's a, that's a reliance on Isaiah there, but this is a new Testament prophet saying that Jesus, this Christ is going to be a light to the Gentiles 
Okay, put that compartment over there. And then the glory to your people, Israel. All right, I mean, what more do you want? I mean, does the New Testament talk about Israel as having a special status before God? I just don't know what else you need, honestly. Uh, I mean, we could go through other texts as well, but to just make blanket statements like that, and then for people to believe them, that's the scary part. People are like, yes, you know, you're, you're right. Well, I mean, let's just do our own study. Let's be Bereans and look at this and show that there's, you know, there's a lot here. Uh, we can we can definitely check this, and and we have. And I think that there are there are some problems uh, with the claim that the New Testament or the Old Testament doesn't refer to Israel as God's chosen people. So hopefully that will be uh, helpful in thinking through that aspect. Okay, now we continue, uh, and well. I'll skip over this next part because basically for the next two minutes, they talk about the idea that we really need to witness to Israel, that they're not God's chosen people. They've mentioned that before. And yeah, I'll just say it again. It's not an either or fallacy, right? Uh, so so it's, it's, it's both and. We do need to witness to Israel that at, in Paul's words, the gospel goes to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to, to the Gentile. And yes, that, that's absolutely biblical, but we also need to acknowledge that that's uh, incorrect to say that that it's an either or fallacy. Okay, now skipping over. So we're at 4330 now, and this is where Romans 2 and Romans 9 are brought together. So 4329, starting there. As I am speaking the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I'm arguing for that for the state of Israel today. That. That's what I'm arguing for, yeah. love. is that love, that sorrow, and unceasing anguish in his heart. I'm, mm. I'm saying Christians should have that for the Jews because they don't know Jesus. That's, that's the point. And so he says, for I could wish... All right, so everyone agrees with that, just so you know. Wish ...that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving, the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from there... Their race, according to the flesh, is the Messiah who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. There's a deity of Christ right there, Romans 9. Just a bonus. Um, <laughs> but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the children promise. Of are counted as offspring. Mm. I, what what are we doing? Striking clarity. What are we doing, Christians? What are we doing when we say things like "I stand unequivocally because they're the chosen people of God"? It's like Paul's arguing explicitly yeah. against right. that idea. He's arguing, yes, yes, physically descended to them. They they were entrusted with the oracles of God. He says in Romans chapter three, they got they were entrusted with God's own word. It, it, they're descended, and and Jesus came from. Uh, the, the Jewish people, he's the Jewish Messiah, but his whole point there is not all are Israel who are descended from Israel. Hmm. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a true Israel, a spiritual Israel, the true Israel, and then there are those who are Israel physically, but not truly Israel. Right. And that's Paul's whole argument. So when we start going, no, 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 Paul, we'll throw that away and just say that those over there who reject Jesus as Messiah, they will not have him rule over them they, they hate the message of Jesus. They are truly Israel? Paul ex explicitly argues against that idea. That's not true. You Gentile out there who is not descended from Israel uh, physically, um, you are the true Jew. You are the descendant of Abraham. You are, mm -hmm. like for real, fully, completely, totally, truly Israel. All right. I hope you heard the logical uh, leap there uh, because each time I hear it, I just, I die a little bit on the inside. So notice what Paul is arguing there. It's the same thing I think in Romans 2, but in Romans 9, it's actually explicit uh, because in Romans 9, he's he's drawing analogy on actually the, physically de descent, the physical descendants of Israel saying, listen, it's not as if the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So in other words, he's he's definitely in this passage. That's why Romans 9 is so helpful. And I think 
it also helps us understand how how Paul is arguing in Romans 2. In Romans 9, he's definitely saying, okay, in this big spectrum of, in this circle of those who are descended from Israel, not everyone in that circle actually belongs to Israel. But he is not, not in a million years in Romans 9 saying that, by the way, the circle of those people who belong to Israel expands to include Gentiles as well. Okay, he's not saying that. He's saying all those who claim to be descended from Israel, they don't actually belong to Israel. And and okay, I there, there's this is so easy to understand. Uh, I I think that we talk like this all the time. I know, maybe an illustration would, would help with this. Okay, so. Uh, I know many people are listening to this from around the world, for which I'm very thankful, and I hope this is helpful. So you can imagine this even from your own cultural context, but I'm just going to use America as the example. Um, but you could use Germany, Africa, any of South Africa. I know we have um, a contingent there. And so you think about what exactly this would look like. Well, as Americans, we understand <clears throat> that there is a citizenship of America that exists. But if you've been paying attention to the news at all, there are people who are a part of the citizenship of America that do not stand up for, they don't actually embrace the American ideals of what it actually means to be American. So I've used this phrase before, and I think many people, many listeners will have used this as well, where I've said, those people are not real Americans. Now, Technically, are they Americans, though? Yes, because they have citizenship. They have, uh, you know, a passport which says that. They have their documents which which give credence to that, Social Security and all of that. So there are there, there is an idea that, yes, there is a citizenship of America, but then there's also those, and they usually <clears throat> belong to a certain political persuasion which, which are pushing against the societal structures and the ideas which have formed this nation, right? And so they're saying, no, uh, we're rebelling against those things. We, we love our, we have our citizenship, but we don't really actually stand up for the ideals. Okay. So there's, there's an America within America. Okay. That's just how it works. Now to make the illustration walk on, you know, all 17 legs, you think about it like this. Let's say we have friends in Europe or Australia or, you know, China, and they actually embrace American ideals. Does that mean they are American? No, of course not. Uh, praise God that they embrace a love for uh, freedom and the expression of you know religion and all of these things which are ideals that are that are really integrated into American society and, and ideals that we hold very dear. But just because somebody agrees with us or or even likes American baseball teams or whatever doesn't mean that they're American. They can agree with us on everything, and yet they can still be considered as non-American because there's more to it than just agreeing with the ideals, okay? And that's basically Paul's argument here. He's saying, listen, out of everybody that belongs to Israel, not everybody actually is embracing what that is supposed to mean, and so they're not re really Israel. This, this has always been just a common uh, way of understanding this passage. I say always. I mean... This is a, this is a very natural way of reading this this passage. There have been plenty of people who have ignored it for the sake of trying to argue that the church is Israel. Okay, but if you just read what Paul's saying, he's not saying that the Israel expands to include Gentiles. He's saying that not everyone within Israel includes, uh, or not everyone within Israel is actually standing for that ideal or a part of what Israel is. And so I think that that is important. The circle, which was already a part of the ethnic status of Jew, is is becoming constricted, just like we were talking about in Romans 2. And now I I think I think that that's important to understand. You know, you just exegete these passages. That that makes way more sense than than arguing that Gentiles are also brought in there, in my mind. You know, but again, you go back to what I said in Romans 2, even if, even if Paul is saying that Gentiles also should be described as uh, as Israel. That doesn't mean that every passage that is referring to Israel or Jewish identity is not actually referring to that, right? And so when we think of this, this category, we need to understand 
everybody's going to have to admit at some degree or another that there are plenty of contexts where the reference to Israel or the reference to Jews is a reference to their ethnic status before God. Okay? I think everybody's going to have to admit that if they're going to be honest uh, biblical interpreters. And so we want to just uh, state, uh, you know, put that out there. Make sure make sure people understand that there is a, a good way of reading these passages, exegeting them. And even if we disagree on that, which I'm, you know, believe it or not, I allow people to disagree with me on interpretations of passages. But if if you do, just make sure you have to be consistent and say, okay, but we cannot take that as a as a canvas or a pattern then and, and just foist it on these other passages. That's just not how real biblical uh, work reading actually functions. Okay, so now we want to keep going, and now we jump in at forty eight oh three. I'll just do it at 48. At 48 now, we talk about how language of Israel is applied to the church. This yeah. body of Christ by his presence. That true temple that we are Amen. a part of, all of us indwell. God now dwells with his people. And he calls us, he calls us in 1 Peter 2, a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood. That's Christians? Exodus. Christians? That's Exodus He language. calls Christians that. Exodus 19. But yeah. Wait, isn't he that says, the temple that needs to be rebuilt? Yeah, yeah. Well, Sorry, we, we could get to that. <laughs> let's, hey, hey, but, well, no, let's one, throw, one let's, at a time. No, but it's no. so big that language. I love when you. I just say one more thing about this. Yeah. When God takes language, He only speaks about Israel, and He applies it to Gentiles. Yeah. He says, "You're God's chosen rejects." Mm-hmm. That's what God says mm-hmm. uh, through Peter. Mm-hmm. He says, "You're uh, chosen by God. You're mm-hmm. loved. You're called." Royal who's, priesthood. Who's the chosen? Who's the called yeah, in what, the Older Testament? You would say Israel. That's it's a, you it's would Israel. Talk, yeah, you talk about Israel. Who's yeah. the royal priesthood? Who did God mm. call as his royal mm. priesthood to Israelites. be a light for the nations? Yeah. And now he's saying about New Testament Christians who do not trace their ancestry mm-hmm. to Abraham. Yeah. Chosen, called, loved, royal priesthood. He's taken the, the exactly those titles that were for Israelites, Jews, and now it's being applied like peanut butter. Across yeah. Jews and Gentiles. Yeah. He says... And he, uh, okay, so you get the point is one of the things that they're... One of the things that they're arguing for is that Israel it has certain descriptions and they they have certain ways that their, their identity is defined and described. And then those descriptions are used for the church. And there are passages that do that. And so that means that Israel and the church are the same. Now let's just examine that logical argument at its face, right? Because there is a premise there. And the premise is that if the same language is used to describe a different entity than what it was used to describe previously, then those are the same entity. And obviously that premise is false. I mean, there, there is no defense for that premise. I mean, you basically have to have more arguments. Now, I'm not saying that's not an argument. I think that's a valid argument to consider. I think we should consider it. I think we should test it. But I think ultimately, when you test it, you can't say that that is a conclusive, persuasive idea to argue that Israel has given way to the church in, it, in its identity. Uh, there's actually more to it. And there's, there's many different ways we can prove this. Okay. Like let's take that premise and see if we apply it to other places. So one of the things in old Testament studies, which is a common, commonly known fact is that there's a polemical use of the old Testament. What, and what I mean by polemical use is that you often have old Testament authors using terminology that belongs elsewhere and applying it to Yahweh. Uh, as a polemical fighting thing saying, oh yeah, you think your God is this? Well, our God is this. Uh, And one of those well-known ideas is the idea of cloud rider. Now, riding on the clouds or cloud rider is a description, a title given to Baal in the Ugaritic writings, right? So when you think of Baal as the cloud rider, that's one of his, uh, one of his, grand descriptions about who he is and what he does is Baal is the one who rides on the clouds. Well, you have passages like Psalm 104 verse 3, where it talks about Yahweh riding on the clouds, Isaiah 19, 1, riding on the clouds. 
And it's basically beyond doubt that the Ugaritic texts were prior to Scripture. Uh, and so Baal was technically described as being the cloud rider first. Now, this is why liberals, liberals used to say, so again, we don't want to be on the team of liberals, at least not in this area. Uh, liberals used to say, and I probably still do, I don't know, I haven't read, I haven't read uh, a commentary recently on this, but they used to say that Israel, when they were invented or when they emerged as a people from amongst other peoples, they incorporated Baal and basically made ba- made Baal Yahweh. Okay, so so Yahweh is Baal, and that's why you have these similar descriptions. So they were saying, look, Baal is called Cloud Rider, Yahweh is called Cloud Rider, therefore they are the same. But listen, there are other reasons why you might use the same language to describe two different entities. And one of those uses in the Old Testament in particular would be what's called the polemical use, where you have the nations around Israel talking about how great Baal is and he's the great rider of the clouds. And then you have Israel saying, no, Yahweh is actually the cloud rider. And so there's there's two different entities having two different descriptions, but you, you use similar, well, even identical in many ways, titles in order to define uh, and, and make a rhetorical point. I think we understand that. And at the same time, there are other examples of that as well. Think about Melchizedek, for example. Uh, Melchizedek is a well-known figure. Uh, well, I say well-known just probably because of all the mystery that's involved with him is he shows up in Genesis 14. David may, has some meditation about him in Psalm 110, and then he shows up in Hebrews 5 and 7 primarily, and you have the author of Hebrews waxing eloquently about exactly the connection between Jesus and Melchizedek, and he uses a lot of the same language. Now, I actually don't know what Durbin thinks about Melchizedek, but but most people um, are hesitant to say that Melchizedek is Jesus. Perhaps Durbin would say that Melchizedek is Jesus. Uh, most people would say that Melchizedek is a real king that interacts with Abraham, who's the who's the king of Salem at that time, Jerusalem, uh, and and he worships God. He's a priest and a king, and so in doing that, uh, Abraham interacts with him. Uh, Melchizedek. We don't know anything else about him in the Old Testament, other than that he apparently worshipped Yahweh, right? And then in Hebrews, the author is using that comparison to show why why a priest king idea actually works because we have templates in the past like Melchizedek and there's these correspondences between Jesus and Melchizedek. So I think that that's the best way to understand it. But again, the point is you have similar descriptions between Melchizedek and Jesus and I don't think they're the same person, right? But it's it's to draw a comparison and to draw a similarity between them. And the author of Hebrews is actually drawing upon that, quoting some of the references to Melchizedek and saying, this is how we are to understand Jesus, right? So that that seems to make a lot of sense. Now, here, here's another thing. So that's, I mean, there are lots of examples of this, right? I'm just trying to show you that similarity uh, does not equal identity. That's just a very basic, basic, logical, important uh, fact to grapple with. But just think about Israel in and of itself. If you think about the descriptions of Israel, Israel language also applies to Jesus. And this is a well-established fact. This is actually a really exciting, uh, I I wrote my THM thesis a little bit on this with regard to the Davidic kings and how it interacts with Jesus. And, And if you think about how Israel language interacts with Jesus, a lot of times people talk about the corporate solidarity of Jesus, where Jesus uh, is the corporate representative of Israel. And sometimes you have passages that are even quoted that originally referred to Israel, and then now they refer to Jesus. So out of Egypt, I called my son, which originally Hosea 11, 1 referred to Israel. But now in Matthew 2, 15, it refers to Jesus coming out of Egypt. Why? How could that be? Does that mean that Jesus is the same identity as Israel? No. No, that's obviously logically false. But there's a representative aspect of Christ representing Israel, incorporation, corporate representation. That's that's very a uh, very well established both on, you know, covenantal as well as dispensational theological paradigms. This is something that many people embrace. In fact, uh, Mike Vlock has a great article 
on how the corporate representation of Jesus uh, doesn't mean that Israel has no no lasting significance. Uh, but there, there we can embrace that, and and yet there retains a future for Israel. I think that that's that's very obvious in how different passages portray things, right? So all I'm saying is that you have Israel, Jesus, and the church all having similar descriptions. Now, that doesn't mean that they're all the same. They each can retain certain functionality, right? They can all retain certain aspects of identity. By the way, since since it's uh, since I'm thinking of it right now, I'll also say that think about this idea where um, identity, take, taking a certain passage of scripture and then, and then foisting it on another uh, passage of scripture, that is actually, and, and I'm, I know uh, that this is where I would say Durbin and, and these guys are, are on the right side. They, they're fighting for a, a non-egalitarian viewpoint. You know, I, I firmly would hold to complementarianism uh, where, you know, there's a, there's a complementing aspect between husband and wife, male and female. They're not the same. Okay. Uh, they are not equal um, ontologically. And one of those, so, so I know Durbin and those guys would be on board with me on that. But one of the interesting things, and I have this because I've been, uh, in the past, I've done work in the LGBT arena and whatnot. And one of the the arguments that is often used is taking a passage like Galatians 3.28, there's no male or female. And then taking that as the paradigm saying, okay, we're going to put that on passages that seem to teach a difference between man and woman. Well, we know that it can't teach a difference between man and woman because Galatians 3.28 teaches there's no male or female. And we know that we have to be equal, that that, that needs to be our foregoing assumption. And then we can interpret those other passages as, as leftover exegetical uh, fossils or some something like that. And all I'm trying to say is that we need to avoid doing such things is that remember looking at each passage contextually and not taking passages like Romans 2 even though I would say that there's a valid way to 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 understand that taking taking Romans 2 and a certain interpretation of Romans 2 and then putting that on other passages that just doesn't that that's not consistent with a good solid biblical interpretation hermeneutic okay so I I just I remembered that right there and I wanted to really make sure that I pointed that out because when when you're claiming to make these kinds of judgments and trying to equate different identities and and the interrelationship of passages we need to be very, very careful that we're not falling into the same hermeneutical practices that get us into all sorts of trouble and ultimately I think that this is, hopefully is a, a a good warning with regard to that. Okay, last last example I'll give with regard to the with regard to the similarity of language being used would be the Messiah and the church, right? Um, so you think about you think about how Paul uh, instructs the Roman church. In Romans 16, verse 20, he says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Now, most people acknowledge that there's a parallel being drawn there between the Genesis 3.15 promise where the Messiah is going to come and crush the serpent under his heel, right? Now, with that same language being used there, does that mean that the church, because remember now this language is being used to the church. So does that mean, brace yourself, that the church is the Messiah? If you say yes, I'm sorry, you and I can no longer be friends. You know, that's just ridiculous. And nobody would say that because you understand. No, just because there's similar language used to describe the relationship and to describe the role does not mean that they are the same in identity. And so uh, Romans 16, 20 is an example of that. How about Revelation 2, 26 through 27, uh, where Jesus says, the one who conquers and keeps my works until the end, to him, I will give authority over the nations. And I will, and and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my Father. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it should, because that is a quotation of Psalm two, which is a messianic psalm. It relates to the Messiah, and that same language then is being used for the one who overcomes uh, from the church, right? So, if you think about that, this is very important to understand. If you think about it, that does not mean, 
I'm sure the Mormons and you know any other cult will go crazy on this, is that they could take this and say, look, we ourselves are the Messiah. No, no, obviously not. But do you see the point is that my, my major big takeaway is simply this. Scripture regularly uses similar language, even direct quotes, to apply in other situations. So to argue that the church is a chosen race, a royal priesthood, amen and amen. That is our role, right? The church has been granted this role to function in this capacity, especially since Israel's in a timeout, in rebellion, in judgment from God. They are in exile right now. They continue that way because they have not repented. And so the church has this role, this responsibility, which mirrors what Israel did in many ways, right? And so that's not wrong. I mean, that's great. We, we, it's not as if, uh, yeah, it's not as if to use the phrase that was used at the beginning of the video, that we are the stepchildren who have no real place in the people of God. Again, most dispensationalists or people who hold to a future for Israel, most, most people would not say that. And so again, I think that that's a, uh, a mischaracterization, a uh, false, false argument of, of certain kinds. And so I think that that's an important thing to, to wrestle with is just similar, similar language does not mean the same identity. Okay. And I think that that, that would be helpful. Now, after this point in the video, we could keep going. This video is like two and a half hours. Uh, so obviously we've gone quite a, quite a while already, uh, over an hour and Nobody wants to continue. I know that. Uh, I can't continue today anyway. But as the video goes on, they talk about how God would be offended if the temple was rebuilt and sacrifices would be reinstituted. Man, I really wanted to review some of that, but for sake of time, we're not going to. I'll just say that they misunderstand the sacrificial system and they think that, or at least from the clip that I watched, they seem to think that all sacrifices are related to sin and uh, forgiveness, uh, atonement, but that's just not the case. Um, you read, yeah, I, I've done, you know, one of my favorite parts to teach in Leviticus is on the sacrificial system because a lot of people just misunderstand it. So I think that there's some misunderstanding on their part, uh, but we'll, we'll have to get into that at a different time. Then they talk, uh, in survey fashion of Matthew 24, I've, I've done one review of, of Durbin's sermons on Matthew 24 and in the future, I hope to do more, but, uh, they get into Matthew 24. And so we don't have time to get into that today. But I'll have, to, I'll have to address those at some point. Now, the key takeaway to all of this, at least what I'm hoping to get across, is there was a lot of emotionalism in this video, a lot of appeal to emotion uh, about, hey, Israel's rejecting Christ or rejecting Christians. That, that can't mean that they're Christians or that can't mean that they're God's chosen people. And nobody is arguing, or at least nobody should argue, that character uh, is related to your chosen status. Remember, that's God's choice. That's his decision, not not ours. And it's not on the basis of works of righteousness, which he has done or which we have done. Uh, but according to his mercy, he saves us. And so, you know, he is the he is the potter. We are the clay. All these are, are just very important principles of God's sovereignty. And, and I think that that applies uh, in in these realms. And so a lot of assumptions in these videos, a lot of in, in my mind, a bit of sloppy exegetical work. Uh, so, you know, I just try to try to respond and hope hope it's helpful for people to hear these responses. I, I don't know. You know, I know they have they have a big audience and, you know, I, uh, I just think it's helpful to have some responses. Uh, I don't necessarily take great pleasure in reviewing these kinds of things uh, because I don't want to cast dispersion on my my brother's in Christ to say, you know, making, making them out to be enemies. I just think overall, we should be striving to read the Bible better. And I think these are good examples to show why we need to read the Bible better instead of make these, these assumptions, these emotional arguments, these exegetical mistakes, these fallacies. I just think we need, we need to do better. And so uh, hopefully this is helpful with regard to that. And if it's not, or if I've misrepresented people, you, you know where to find me, you know, uh, just, just, uh, Use the contact form on my website, you know, reach out to me, I, which I do appreciate all of you that have done that. Um, and I appreciate uh, meeting everyone at the conference uh, the, the, a couple of weeks ago. It was really, really fun to, to get to see a lot of new faces, people who had been listening to the podcast and 
I just wanted to encourage me with that. And so I appreciate all of that. So in any case, hope this has been helpful. You know where to find me. You can find out more about Shepherds Theological Seminary, shepherds.edu. You can also visit my website, petergaiman.com, and contact me there through the form on my website. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.